Welcome to the Startup Grind. Get up on your feet and join me in welcoming Brad and Heidi Janenga of WebPT. Getting in the chair part is the hard part of the evening. <laughs> All right, guys. So here at Startup Grind, it's partly about the, um, the business, but it's also a lot about the people behind the business. So we're going to start by talking about who Brad and Heidi are. So we'll start with you, Heidi. Tell us about your early life, your family, kind of where you grew up, anything that comes to mind about those early years of where Heidi started. Okay, um, so I was born in Westlaco, Texas to an Austrian uh, immigrant father um, and a Japanese mother who was born first generation in Hawaii. Um, we lived there for about six years and then moved to Florida where actually is really where I grew up in Winter Park, Florida, right outside of Orlando. Uh, went to high school there, was um, a, an athlete, five, five uh, sport athlete, and ended up getting a wow. s scholarship to, uh, in basketball to the UC Davis in California. Um, decided to go across country to go to school and did that. Um, and when I, I graduated with um, uh, biological sciences and exercise physiology bachelor's degree and then went on to get my master's in physical therapy swung back across the United States to um, University of St. Augustine in Florida to get my master's in physical therapy. Okay. That's how it all started. Any, any brothers or sisters or anything I like have that? a brother um, who is a lawyer. He lives in Chicago, um, and he is married, has a beautiful cats, no kids, but has some <laughs> beautiful cats that he considers his kids. That's awesome. <laughs> and... Uh, Obviously, we'll tell a little bit more of the story about Brad and I self, but we also have a beautiful four-and-a-half-year-old daughter named Ava. Aw, very cool. All right, Brad, give us the lowdown. It all started <laughs> on a bright and sunny day. <clears throat> um, I'm sure it was. <laughs> um, so I was actually uh, born um, outside of Chicago, which my family goes way back in. Um, I'm of Dutch ancestry. Um, moved to Phoenix when I was 10 years old, uh, grew up in Cave Creek, um, riding dirt bikes and shooting BB guns and uh, making a mess of a lot of things. Um, and, uh, you know, went to Cactus Shadows, um, went to Chandler High, and then ended up finishing my high school career at Bradshaw Mountain in Prescott Valley. Um, my dad is a uh, long distance truck driver, uh, which is why we ended up in um, uh, Prescott Valley. He was, uh, was the ACE uh, retail support center was there. Um, and I uh, went to U of A, studied uh, management information systems, um, started as a philosophy major actually. Um, and uh, after that, um, moved to California and pursued a technology career and then came back to Arizona about a decade ago and met this, this lady uh -huh. right here. Got it, all right. So before we go there, Heidi, do you remember what you wanted to be when you grew up? Yeah, I wanted to be a lot of things. I think it started out wanting to be a veterinarian. I loved animals. We had all kinds of a menagerie uh, in, our, we, in our house, um, from parakeets to actually, we even hatched an alligator. Uh, from an wow. egg. We, so my dad was a, a horticulturist and worked with citrus, so out in the groves you would find alligator nests. And so one day they stumbled on one and he thought it would be really cool to bring an egg home. So oh. we did, we brought it home, put wow. it in an aquarium, hatched it. Your and mother was a saint, it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yes, very much so, for many, many reasons. <laughs> but yeah, a veterinarian uh, was pretty much what I wanted to, to okay. uh, thought I was gonna be when I grew up. And how about you? Oh, I actually wanted to be a chef when I was a kid. A chef? Yeah, either a chef or a superhero. Oh, one of the two, all right. Maybe you could combine it. I mean, I think there's room in the market for a superhero chef. All right, any early signs of entrepreneurship, Heidi? You know, I would say probably not so much. I hated having to go door to door and sell candy uh, for whatever fundraising event there was. Um, and didn't necessarily um, have, like, I, I mean, we did the lemonade stand. We did really fun, creative things in our neighborhood. I was actually a, very much a tomboy growing up, and I was one of, like, a group of our gang of 
like seven different kids that were uh, about the same age in our neighborhood. Um, and we were so creative. We made it ha a haunted house every year. We did a 4th of July parade for the neighborhood. Um, but we never asked for money for any of those things. So I don't know <laughs> if that really bars for, for entrepreneurship so much. That's okay. How about you, Brad? Um, yeah, so um, I've always been an entrepreneur. And I think that you know, if I look back at my family history, like we've been entrepreneurs for a very, very long time. Um, uh, my first entrepreneurial kind of, I think, um, signs were I used to collect my allowance and then use that allowance to go to um, Price Club, which is now Costco, and I would buy uh, those big giant jugs of blow pops, um, and I would take them into my locker in like third, fourth, fifth grade, and I'd sell them for like 75 cents a piece, which was like a 3x <laughs> margin on what I was buying them for. <laughs> Um, and then, the in, uh, yeah, in middle school, I started growing up in Cape Creek. I started a uh, business cleaning horse stalls and, um, got to the point where I kind of recruited all my neighbors and, and were cleaning their horse stalls and got to the point actually where I had enough business to where I could hire my friends. And my job became just actually going around and collecting money and paying money. So <laughs> nice. Pretty, uh, pretty cool. nice delegation, one of those early skills to learn. Got it. All right, so tell us the story of when you two first met slash how WebPT was born. Uh, we'll start with your version, Brad. <laughs> uh, all right, so, um, so I just come back to uh, Arizona and uh, my, uh, my sister still lives there. I have a lot of family and that kind of stuff and was um, you know, kind of doing a couple different things and wasn't sure I was gonna stay here for a long time. Um, I think we have to go there with the uh, Full story. I think that's why she's egging us on a little bit. She knows it. This is good, guys. This is good. Um, all right, we're going deep. Um, so <laughs> I had moved back here and you know, kind of lost contact with everybody that I knew um, growing up here. And my sister encouraged me to go on Match.com and do a little bit of dating. So I went on Match.com and I put up a picture of my yellow lab, who is adorable. Um, and the email started flooding in. Um, Wasn't for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Heidi hates this part of the story, but <laughs> I spent three months dating a bunch of different women and had uh, <laughs> spent entirely too much money on you know stuff. But um, my subscription was about to expire um, for Match, and uh, I uh, had mostly been fielding um, inbound requests due to my yellow lab, and. Um, <laughs> I figured before my subscription ends, I should uh, go and do the advanced search. And uh, so I went in there and, you know, 65 questions, build your perfect woman. Um, I hit search and uh, three women popped out. Um, one of them I wasn't really all that attracted to from a picture standpoint. I know that's incredibly shallow. <laughs> I'm going to say it. Hey. True confession. I'll own up to it. Um, the second one I met at Starbucks, um, and from the time we ordered our coffee to the time we got our coffee, we're like, yeah, let's, like, no chemistry type of thing. Um, and then uh, Heidi, um, because she's uh, Mrs. Frugal, um, very, very, uh, which is an awesome thing, guys, <laughs> listen to me. The wife that wants the $600 Gucci purse, not always an awesome thing. <laughs> Um, where was I? I'm sorry. Um, the lucky number three. The lucky number three, right. So, <laughs> um, so Heidi had let her, part of her subscription expire, so she could browse, but she couldn't like reach out. It's functionality, you know, right? Pay, pay for users, that kind of stuff, right? Tease them with functionality. Um, and so, uh, she had her friend reach out to me and say, you know, the, the friend that you're trying to get a hold of can't respond back to you, but here's her email address. And so we played phone tag a little bit. Um, and then I gave my phone number to Heidi. They're getting, they're getting the full story. Yeah, what's really funny is that I had a Hotmail address at the time. <laughs> is that hilarious in itself? Um, but it, within sort of the match functionality, you couldn't actually put your email because they wanted you to actually get a subscription. So you know, there's people that figured out how to get around it, so it was the mail that is hot. And that was how we kind of finally connected to be able to exchange email addresses. I was, I was clever enough to get that, so. Uh. <laughs> um, so she called me and I was actually on a date. I was literally driving to a restaurant with another girl in the front seat of my car, but I was super excited about Heidi. And I tried to play it off and I did a terrible job at it, which she totally called me on. Um, he told me he was in the car with his mom. <laughs> I'm not kidding. 
I'm like, really, your mom? <laughs> um, so I told her. I... <laughs> that happened, whatever. Um, so uh, we arranged. I said, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit busy right now. I'm tied up with my mom. And um, uh, are you available tomorrow at 5? And she's like, yeah, whatever. And I'm, I'm traveling. Call me at 5 tomorrow. And I'm like, all right. And uh, I went the next day. And at about 4.30, I started preparing for a phone call. <laughs> And, uh, you know, was ready and, you know, at five o'clock, um, made a phone call and we had a four hour conversation. Our first conversation was about four hours. We arranged to have a date, um, the following week, uh, which I think was a, probably a Thursday night, um, went to Zen 32, um, for sushi. <laughs> and, um, I had gone to, uh, Tokyo a few years prior and with the uh, half Japanese and the sushi thing, we just had, you know, a lot of stuff to talk about and, um, Let's see, then we went to the Merc Bar, and we had a cocktail there, and finally, it's, it's like, it turns into like the six hour date, and then we end up going back to our cars, and she couldn't keep her hands off me. And... <laughs> this is why I asked for his side of the story, Heidi. This is way more interesting. Exactly. Yeah, girls, girls usually don't want to let out these secrets. <laughs> okay, so keep going, the web PT part at, at some point. <laughs> Um, so we, uh, we started dating and I think within like three dates we were like, uh, we decided to make it exclusive. Um, we just hit it off. I mean, it was pretty, pretty amazing. I'd never connected with a woman, um, you know, like that before. And, um, uh, I tried everything I could to be cool and, you know, make her like me. And, uh, at one point we were in the dating process. We were actually driving. We had gone to my dad's house in Prescott Valley and, uh, we're driving back and she was telling me about her clinic and, you know, some of the stuff she was doing. She had, uh, well, you'll hear the story, but, um, ran a, a very large sports therapy clinic and, uh, started talking about kind of lowering her expenses. And one of the biggest expenses that was, uh, you know, could be, played with was uh, dictation, which was like $3,000 a month. And um, so she was looking for a um, piece of EMR software and given my background, she asked me to just kind of help her, uh, um, you know, help her find something. And, and she was like the coolest chick I ever, you know, got to date and I was trying to impress her. So I built her an EMR. <laughs> so there we go. That's the short version, I, I think it sounds like. So what would you add to this, Heidi? Did, did he leave anything out? Cause I'm not sure he did. But uh, yeah, possible. not much, really. <laughs> There's not left anything to the imagination whatsoever, that's for sure. Um, just on the, on the business side, I mean, it, it was definitely a business problem that I was trying to solve within my practice. Um, I was running three different clinics and responsible for P&Ls. And really, it was a big issue with reimbursements. Anybody in healthcare understands what's happened over the last 10, 15 years with reimbursements steadily declining. Um, and trying to maintain a decent or even same kind of bottom line, you automatically look at your expense line. Um, and a lot of our referring physicians were starting to transition into using electronic medical record. This is right around the time the Affordable Care Act got passed with the mandate that required um, physicians to uh, transition into using digital documentation. Uh, unfortunately and fortunately, physical therapists, which is... By the way, I am a physical therapist, so I'm the PT in what PT. Um, we're not actually considered eligible professionals, so we did not fall under that meaningful use in, uh, umbrella in which, so therapists do not get the incentive to actually adopt an electronic medical record. Oh and, man, still have to do it, but no incentive. Huh? Yeah, I still got to do it. So it's kind of the rising tides, kind of uh, raises all boats mentality. Um, but at the time, you know. We went and I challenged Brad to go look, he was the technology guru, um, and said, hey, listen, there, there's gotta be something out there for physical therapists. And what we went out and looked at was astounding. First of all, has anybody been to physical therapy before? So you know it's very active, right? And they don't really see a therapist sitting behind the desk much, at least you, you shouldn't. Um, <laughs> and so there was really no web-based platform out there. It was all client-server-based. Um, and it was very clunky and extremely expensive, even for a clinic the size of mine that we had, you know, uh, upward of 45 employees and 20 therapists. Uh, it was just not something that we could really budget for. And so um, initially it was supposed to be just what we decided to build. It was really just for my clinic. 
I started talking to some of my colleagues. They were experiencing the same thing that I was experiencing, and they were like, hey, let me, let me try this. Um, they started giving us positive feedback, and that snowball started. And this was, I mean, the idea was spawned in 2006. We did a little market research. We found that 80% of physical therapists were still using pen and paper at the time. And we kind of scratched our heads and said, hmm, I think we might have stumbled onto something here. We're getting positive feedback. There's a need in the market. It seems to be meeting our needs in, in the clinic. It's user-friendly. So in 2008, we launched the product. Um, we hired employee number one. Hire, we started in the back, literally back of a coffee shop in downtown Phoenix, right off of 7th Street. If anybody knows Humble Pie and that strip mall right there, <laughs> it used to be a coffee shop called Drip Coffee Lounge. And Brad was working out of the house at, at the time, and anybody who's worked at home understands there's always distractions. So he's got a, an affinity to coffee. Um, and started working out of that coffee house, got to know the barista. They were like, hey, we've got this storeroom we want to sublease in the back. <laughs> it was definitely a storeroom. <laughs> Um, probably half the size of this stage that we're on here now. We could fit two IKEA desks in there. But it was all we needed at the time, right, to really get started and get the platform started to build and, and off, on, off and running. Um, and that's really where the story sort of, I guess, begins in terms of the company. Um, and now we have 30,000 square feet, right, still down here in downtown Phoenix, 270 employees. We'll hit 34 million in revenue this year. So it's pretty cool. nice. <laughs> Very cool. All right. So in those first five years, at some point, was there kind of a tipping point where it went from having to focus on building your product and finding profitability to managing growth? And like, how did that change the way that you looked at your business? How were you able to go from kind of let's build this thing to oh my gosh, let's like scale this thing? You know, it was, it was two very different phases. I mean, I built it for Heidi's Clinic, and it was, it was built and working in there, and, and it wasn't until, you know, like 15 of the 18 other clinic directors in the region adopted this thing in like a week and a half that we realized, like, oh, crap, like, we might have hit something here. Um, but we grew gangbusters, like, straight out of the gate. I mean, it was, it's, I mean, our first three years were 300% year-over-year growth, and it's, it's been great triple digit. To have. Yeah, it's been triple digit <laughs> pretty cool. much every year since. I mean, um, so, so managing the growth, it's like we were always growing. Um, so it wasn't, you know, kind of this switched phase type of thing. I think we were always drinking from the fire hose. And that's just how we evolved as a company. And, and, and you know, the culture and, and all of that kind of came as a result of how fast the marketing, or the market was adopting to our product. Yeah, I think that um, I would totally obviously agree that hyper growth has been an incredible ride. You, it's just definitely learning every single day. Um, but there is a, definitely a, a sort of a tipping or change point. Um, and we took on funding in two different rounds. We've taken two rounds of funding in. Um, one in 2010, and that was from an angel investor here locally with Canal Partners. And really that was actually a fundamental change in the way that we were able to think and actually do. Um, because at that point, we were any money we were we were basically living hand uh, hand to mouth at that point. Any money that we would make, we would make an assessment as to what are the the most important needs of the organization in the business at that point, and then hire that. Was it a server or was it a person, right? And we would have to really make very very strong prioritization of what would, did we really need. And then when once we got that million dollars, we were able to then step on the gas a little bit and, and really sort of organize and say, okay, we can do multiple things at once versus having to be very focused on one thing. And then we kept our nose to the grindstone and just, you know, just crushed all the metrics and continued to grow with that million dollars, turn that million dollars into to, to, I don't know, 25 million. And VCs were definitely knocking throughout that period and we finally banging. made a decision. <laughs> they were banging. Um, made the decision to take in a second round of funding, which also allowed us to do, take a little bit of money off the table. I mean, we've been running for eight years at that point, um, and we had bootstrapped for that first really, you know, six, four years of the, work of the company um, before we actually took that first round of funding in. But now with institutional capital in since 2014, 
it's definitely changed how we think about things and just the organization's a bit different. We're in a much different phase of growth, if you will, even though it's still hyper growth. It's, it's a focus on efficiency. It's a focus on specialization of people versus people wearing multiple hats, if you will. Um, and so definitely a different sort of um, a concentration of, of what we're focusing on within the organization. Very cool. So I know um, we all have seen and probably once in a while been the entrepreneur that feels like they have an idea and wish someone would just provide all the money to make it happen. But you guys are what I look at as the perfect recipe in that you went through the early stages through Bootstrap where you had to be scrappy, you had to refine, you had to become good business owners first and then you used capital to grow. Um, what's your perspective having gone through that? I mean, do you feel like there's um, a certain recipe or a certain balance that you think is important? Would you do, have done it any different if you could now looking back? What's your perspective on what entrepreneurs should expect and what kind of lessons they can learn by choosing different paths when how early they accept funding? Um, I think investors invest in businesses, not ideas. Um, I'm a, I'm a hardcore bootstrap guy. I don't like um, outside capital. I'm not the type of guy that likes somebody breathing down my neck and, and um, uh, the inability to make decisions on my own. And so um, the way that I approach it as an entrepreneur is, is funding and outside capital is a tool just like my laptop is a tool or my business card is a tool or anything else is a tool. Um, you know, I think uh, the longer, if you can build a viable business, you know, with with seed money and friends and family and that kind of stuff, and 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 go out and hit a market opportunity and show traction, people will line up to help you capitalize on that market. Um, you know, entrepreneurs that get super frustrated and say you can't raise money should probably look at what they're trying to raise money for. It's not, you know. Um, it, it's, it's very different, you know, and it, it's super cool to be an entrepreneur right now. It's super cool to be in technology right now. Um, and so everybody's kind of trying to get there and, um, you know, going out and just raising money is not the answer, right? I mean, it's, it's, you should use money as a tool, you know, in your growth, which is exactly what we did. I mean, we were, you know, over a million in revenue, um, you know, when we went out and raised money and we raised just enough money to pay for, um, you know, the server farm that we needed to build to, to accept the traffic that we were having and, and staff out ahead of ourselves for a few months. Um, and then we took that, that million dollars and grew to 25 and then, you know, took in another big chunk. And that's, it's a, it's a stage thing, right? Like money is not the answer. And, and I see a lot of entrepreneurs waste a lot of money um, trying to prove something out that, you know, you could have done for, you know, pennies of what you're spending to do. It's nice you guys had a technical co-founder as well as a business expert. That's kind of the perfect recipe to be able to I'm bootstrap sometimes. I'm not a business sometimes. expert. <laughs> <laughs> Subject matter expert. Yeah, Subject I'm, matter I'm just expert. a dorky guy. There right? we go. That's what I meant. Well, and, what, and just one more thing I would like to add, just in something we've learned um, just since going through this process, is the value of your equity. And that's why we're such big proponents of... Um, bootstrapping as long as you can because you don't understand the value of your ownership and your equity that you have when your company isn't worth anything. Or you're trying to project something that you think it might be worth, but you have no idea what it's really worth or what it could be worth should you really get someone to actually tra get traction to buy your pro actual product and show that people want your product. Um, when we hired employee number one, we had no idea what our equity meant, and we made promises, and we had, you know, documents and things that we, and we had to go back and negotiate as we went through our process because we learned the value of our equity. Um, and as an, as an entrepreneur, that's basically what you have. It's your company, right? And that is the, probably the most meaningful piece outside of the problem that you're solving and the people that you touch and what you're able to um, you know, produce with your with what you're what you're building, um, but outside of that, it's your equity. And I can't emphasize that enough that it is you have to understand how valuable that piece is. Okay, good. So when you mentioned your team, employee number one, um, how has your perspective changed over the year? I mean, scaling from one to lots and lots of employees. What have you come to understand about hiring, or what's you know looking back? What's your what's your perspective on how to build a team? now? 
So honestly, our perspective hasn't really changed much since the very beginning. Um, we, I talked about specialization. We obviously now have very specialized uh, job roles that we are hiring for. Um, but we still at WebPT hire for culture first. We absolutely look for outside factors that, you know, anybody can, I mean, I, I get 10 resumes that all seem really awesome, but when we actually get to meet that person um, and ask them all kinds of questions like, what do you think about garden gnomes? Um, that we tend to like, right? Uh, and all kinds of really f fun off the wall questions that really get to understand who this person really is, right? Behind the uh, interview persona that you're trying to put across that everyone does, right? Trying to put your best foot forward. Trying to get behind some of those layers to really understand who this person is and how they really work um, is critical to how we do, we complete our interview process. Um, and we've always, from the very beginning, done sort of this one first initial interview, um, and then we always conclude with a peer interview to have the people that are actually going to work side by side with this individual be a part of the interview process and actually have a vote in uh, whether or not this person actually gets hired because it's critical to uh, the collaboration component and the, and the culture that we've created um, to make that really be congruent with whoever we hire and bring on. Yeah, I like that. Um, all right, so looking back on the journey, um, is there anything you wish someone had told you like back at the beginning now, or is there anything you would tell your younger self type of a thing? <laughs> uh, so going back to sort of the labels and titles, I think that um, as being part of this success story, sort of the label of an entrepreneur, or even labels in general, but label of an entrepreneur means a lot to a lot of different things to a lot of people. Um, and you know, I'm proud to now call myself an entrepreneur, even though I may not necessarily fit the molds that, that most people think about, who's like a, a, a ridiculous risk taker who's just willing to do anything to get, you know, a business off the ground. Um, there's, there's just a lot of different things that make up like a true entrepreneur, and there's in the risk taking in general can be calculated risk. It doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, just jumping off a cliff and seeing what happens. Um, and so I think just in general for me, it's it's understanding sort of the, the greater business aspect of the titles and what those really mean. I think um, earlier on, if I would have known more about that, I think maybe some decisions would have been made differently. But, you know, I'm, I'm super proud to call myself an entrepreneur now, even though I may not have, you know, done all of the things and being a hustler back in the day. I think over time, it's just a different sort of mentality. And then also, I think just success in general is really based on what you believe your success is. Especially as an entrepreneur, I think too many people put in the bucket of getting the amazing amount of funding from you know, a VC firm as success versus potentially having a lifestyle business that you are making a million dollars a year, but you're pulling off a million dollars a year, awesome. And you're doing that year after year after year. You're an entrepreneur just like, you know, Steve Jobs was. It's just different flavors in an entrepreneur. And I, I just um, really have embraced the fact that there's, there's lots of different flavors and you should be very proud of yourself for what you do and what you accomplish. And you define your own success every single day. I like that, that's good. What was the question again? <laughs> Sorry, I was daydreaming over here. Squirrel. It's okay. Squirrel. Uh, is there anything you would tell your early, your younger self at this point? Um, probably not to take myself so seriously. Yeah. Um, I've learned not to do so, um, and I think it's helped <laughs> me <laughs> tremendously as a person. Um, yeah, I think uh, you know, um, you know, you put your head down and you work hard, and and you know, I think. Um, you know, we've been lucky and, and have had a little bit of success. And I think uh, just kind of, you know, reflecting back on, you know, what a great opportunity that's been and, and you know, just to be, uh, to take that in, you know, like it's, it's, uh, um, you know, we lucked out. I mean, stars align for us and it's been super cool. And, and you know, it's just, uh, it's cool to be able to kind of appreciate that. Good, good. All right. So let's look forward a little bit now. Um, 
tell us a little bit about your passion for downtown Phoenix. I mean, what's going on here? Tell us a little bit about what's up with that and what you guys are focused on going forward here. Um, you know, I think it really all started um, when we were trying to find an office that wasn't lame. That wasn't lame. Um, and I guess most of what we were seeing was, you know, pretty lame. And so we looked and looked and looked and looked and looked. And really the only thing that wasn't lame was in the warehouse district. And, um, you know, I, I, you know, I, the early part of the first decade of my career was in Southern California and, and all up and down the coast and, and traveling quite a bit. And so I'd kind of experienced these um, entrepreneurial, you know, uh, centers a little bit more in, in other cities that I'd worked in. And um, when I came back to Phoenix, you know, didn't really find that so much here. And I think that's really because we, uh, we grew out as a city instead of growing up as a city. And... I realized that you know the the connectivity and the the conversations and the um, you know just camaraderie, frankly, was kind of missing here. And um, as we started having some success in in our needs for being able to you know recruit more tech talent and and um, you know across the entire company, um, it really just kind of started to become more apparent to us that this. Kind of problem needed to be to be solved, and um, right around that time, I was um, up for the Ernst and Young Entrepreneur of the Year, and uh, had uh, and they do most of the judging through Denver, and uh, I was in Denver, and uh, one of the judges of um, Galvanize, uh, which is a big win that was just announced in the warehouse district here a couple weeks ago. Um, one of the the principals of that company was one of the uh, judges for the entrepreneur, and, and him and I had a conversation. I went and checked out Galvanize the day after, and um, uh, thought that it is exactly what Phoenix needs and is missing. And, and we've had, you know, we have Sky Song, and we have Gangplank, and we have, you know, Scottsdale Park, and, and a number of other to CEI, and all this other kind of stuff that's happening. But it's it, it seemed very siloed to me, you know, like there, wa there wasn't cross-pollination of events. There was, you know, kind of this, this, these usual suspects, right? The same 50 people would show up at, you know, any event where it is. And, and there, was a, there was a much larger community that I was experiencing. And so um, we were already working on the deal with uh, Mike Cowley on the 515 building that we're doing just across the street, which is going to be pretty awesome. But, um, and so we recruited Mike to go up there. Mike kind of got the galvanized bug, and we started three years ago recruiting them down here to um, Phoenix. But I think it all stems, a long answer, but um, it all stems to just, you know, want to have, you know, it, it stems from wanting to have a place where, um, you know, people could feel engaged and, and, and creative and, and have those conversations with subject matter experts and share knowledge and, and have a place where they can go and, and meet with their peers and build something cool. And, and that exists in very small areas. But I think I, I felt at least something, you know, uh, of this scale needed to happen to really kind of put what we're doing here and what's happening around us kind of on the map. And so... Uh, it's, uh, you know, I'm super proud that it finally happened. It's, yeah, it's it, uh, really cool. economic development and uh, commercial real estate development does not have to happen in software development life cycles. So, um, <laughs> a little you bit know, slower? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm like six weeks, you know, new version out type of thing, and this yeah. is like a three-year deal. <laughs> oh, very good. So anything you want to add about your passion for downtown or what you guys are focusing on next? Well, I mean, there's spaces like this, right, that just ooze creativity um, and uh, have really been attractive. Not only that, but it's very central. So people come in, can use the light rail. Um, you know, they are able to, it's a fairly easy commute from lots of different areas around the greater Phoenix area. So it's been a really nice way to have, um, a, you know, great recruiting. Um, to come to the downtown area. It's very easy to get people to want to come down here. Now, I will tell you a funny story. When we first started, it wasn't so easy back in 2010. When we first started, we started at 7th Street and Grant and the Levine Machine Building right there on the corner. And it didn't look like very much like it does today. It very much looked like a warehouse. And when we first started having people call and wanting to come in for interviews, they would literally stay in their car, call us and say, am I in the right place because I think that I'm in the wrong place because I, I Googled it and I got this address, but I really don't think, we even got accused one time of like a bait and switch kind of crazy thing <laughs> that they're like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm calling the police because I'm not coming into your building. Like, this is crazy. Oh 
We actually, Startup Grind two months ago was held in your first office space over at Tufton Needle, so yeah. Oh, very cool. Um, all right, so before we move on to our last little rapid fire question, is there anything else on your mind, anything you'd like to share, anything that um, is just an important thing that you feel needs to be said for entrepreneurs? Last chance. Just kidding. I think we've covered it. Okay, very good. All right, so before we go to the Q&A session with the, with the audience here, um, we are going to do what we like to call 21 questions rapid fire. So I'm just gonna go down a list and you two both get to answer. This is where we get to know a little bit about whether we're on Team Brad or Team Heidi, okay guys? <laughs> so pay attention. Okay, so Heidi, we'll have you go first. Okay. So cats or dogs? Cats. Brad? Dogs. Oh, all right. <laughs> Beer or wine? Wine. Beer. Oh. <laughs> Sushi or tacos? Sushi. Sushi. Ah, there we go. Coke or Pepsi? Coke. Pepsi. <laughs> By the way, this is the story of our lives. Like, literally, we are <laughs> yin and yang. This is what has made us so successful, to be honest with you. That's awesome. Favorite app? Favorite app? Uh, I would have to say either Minion Rush or uh, Geometry Dash, only because my daughter loves to buy my phone, and she's got me hooked. Um, probably the flashlight app, which is really handy <laughs> w when you're like crawling around these dark warehouses trying to figure out a uh, new tech office space. Favorite operating system? This is a political statement. Whatever he says. <laughs> um, probably CentOS. Say that again. Linux flavor. Okay, Linux. <laughs> Favorite holiday? Easter. Thanksgiving. Favorite car? Well, I have to say um, the Tesla Model X, only because I'm getting one. Ooh, nice. <laughs> Finally. So I've known Heidi for 10 years. She's had the same car <laughs> for 10 years. And it's like a 2002 Toyota Highlander with 120,000 miles on it and Cheerios smashed up in the back seat. <laughs> and I have tried everything in my power to get her a new car. And she's like, my car's fine. But finally, so this is a big thing. Her getting a the car. huge splurge for me. That's I can awesome. tell you that. <laughs> That's cool. So your favorite car is her Tesla at this point. Uh, my favorite car is my 1967 Porsche 912. Okay, there we go. Favorite vacation spot. Favorite vacation spot that we've actually been to, um, probably actually the Virgin Islands. That's a tough. What is it? Places that we've been to or places we want to go to? I'll take either. I um, actually went to Amsterdam for the first time last year and uh, found it, I mean, just to be amazing. Okay. Fell in love with the place, absolutely. Very cool. And I, and I blended in, which was like the first time that that's <laughs> ever happened in any country I've ever been to. I'm I was sure. just like, oh, another six foot five blonde guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Favorite book? Favorite book? Um, I've been reading a lot since we started this company, lots of business books. Um, I would say probably Firms of Endearment. And if you've never heard of it, it's a really cool book that finally actually puts some uh, objective measures to culture and how important culture is in a, in a company. Oh, that's an easy Atlas Shrugged. Ah, there you go. <laughs> uh, favorite movie or TV show? It's okay if it's Bachelorette, you can confess, Heidi. Um, actually, no, I'm actually a, I, I'm a, um, what's that travel show? The one that they go around the world? Amazing Race. Amazing Race, yeah, I'm a big Amazing Race fan. And Top Chef, Master Chef, I love those shows. Um, I'll go with movie. Um, probably all-time favorite movie is Pulp Fiction. Um, another one of my favorites is uh, Spy Game, which is, uh, um, <laughs> um, what's the guy's name? on Total Blank. It was uh, Brad Pitt and um, Robert Redford. Yeah, good movie. All right. Your go-to karaoke song? <laughs> um, I would probably say, because I don't do karaoke often, but if I'm in the car and I hear a Bon Jovi song, like Living on a Prayer or something like that, I can belt it out pretty good. I didn't see that one coming. <laughs> That's awesome. 
I hear the train a coming. It's <laughs> rolling round the bend. Nice. Um, so again, the Johnny Cash Orange Blossom special is my go-to. I like it. Anything you collect, Heidi? So since we're going all in, I have to admit, I collect coupons. I'm a couponer. <laughs> Not as much as I used to, but I do collect coupons. <laughs> That's awesome. Seriously, on the weekend, I'm like, hey, you want to go out to dinner tonight? Yeah, I've got a coupon. <laughs> Anything you collect? Um, I collect A players. Hmm. Any unusual skills or talents? I'm not going to have you answer. Um, <laughs> you can pass. It's yeah, okay. Pass. No problem. Um, I know how to beatbox. You can beatbox? I can beatbox. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. That is highly cool. Your top strength in business? I am the get shit done person, so as we talked about before, but I am also very much a collaborator. I feel like I can get all the right people in the room to get shit done. Um, so kind of the, in strength finders terminology, sort of the harmonizer and the, the arranger. Um, I think my skill is uh, identifying, you know, business workflow and making it better with technology. Okay. Um, my strengths finder stuff is ideation and that stuff. I'm a, I'm a, Heidi and I make this joke is that um, I'm for she's trees. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and just really quick, one other thing that I just, from the, from the uh, special kind of things that you have, like, uh, mm -hmm. is I feel like, and, and this is something that I've really gotten to know better as we've grown through um, in this business is I have really great intuition about people. And I get brought in on interviews a lot when there's people that are kind of on the fence for whatever reason. I have a very good sense of first impression with people. Um, and I've learned to trust my instincts and trust my intuition so much more as we've gone along. Ooh, that's a pretty mad skill. Nice. All right, so what profession, like if nothing else mattered, would you attempt beyond what entrepreneurship, you know? Uh, dolphin trainer. Oh, uh, I'd probably be an architect. All right. What is the best compliment someone can give you? That you're an amazing mom. <laughs> um, I think you can never go wrong by telling me I'm handsome or smart or <laughs> kind of well-dressed. <laughs> um, Hair. <laughs> Uh, I think being a good boss, you know, I think um, that really, uh, um, I don't know, makes me feel like, you know, again, trusting your gut, you know, like it, it's to go against the grain and then be, you know, successful at doing it and then being told that, you know, it was an enjoyable experience by the people who worked, you know, with you through that, you know, is kind of cool. What's the cause you're passionate about? Right now, um, the cause that I'm most passionate about, I'm on the board of a nonprofit called Support My Club, uh, which uh, actually takes technology and marries donors with um, clubs, in high, like high school clubs, and allows them to actually um, uh, provide what the schools need. Um, it's really cool, uh, nonprofit. Um, so besides the Arizona startup tech scene, um, I'm uh, really big into conservation, so I grew up in um, Boy Scouts, and, and my family was, you know, camping and fishing and all that kind of stuff, and so um, I'm very concerned about, um, you know, wildlife conservation and, and um, you know, protecting natural spaces and, and the, the biology that's, uh, that's around it. If I could say one more thing that I'm really passionate about is um, this, it's, it's an, uh, an up-and-coming concept. I think it's something that, you know, we have lived and, and done just, again, instinctively, but um, it's move, this movement called Conscious Capitalism. And if you've heard about it, there is there is actually an organization here locally, um, but it's led by um, the, uh, the folks that the CEO of the Container Store and also Whole Foods um, really started kind of really um, bringing this more to the forefront. 
Um, so if you don't know what it means, just the words really kind of sum it up, but I encourage you to learn more. Just go, go to consciouscapitalism.org. It's a really great concept that is very meaningful to any startup, too, that is coming up and born. One thing on your bucket list. Uh, I want to travel around the world. <laughs> um, yeah, that. All right. Well, I suggest Yay! you guys go together. I mean, it seems like an opportunity you know there. All right, and then last one, uh, we'll start with you, Heidi. So generally speaking, what kind of hazards do you have to watch for if you uh, wear basketball shorts around the house when your husband's home? Yeah, so this guy is like the classic deep pantser. So you always have to tie, whether it's your pajama <laughs> pants or your basketball shorts, really, really tight, or else you just never know when someone sneaks up behind you and you're just whoop. <laughs> And in the middle of any event, not just behind closed <laughs> doors, in front of family, Easter festivities, like, he has no shame. For you. <laughs> All right, so um, Brad, generally speaking, what is your stance on whether or not doing donuts in a golf cart while working at a golf course is reasonable grounds for dismissal? Um, absolutely. Is it? Well, I think um, clearly I was way outside of the bounds there. And beyond donuts, we were actually jumping the golf carts oh, off, off the green. Yeah, I, sh I should have been fired. I mean, and we did it 15 times before they caught us. But um, yeah, I've, uh, I've been fired from two jobs um, in my uh, entire life. And one of them was uh, I worked at a golf course up in Cave Creek. And uh, we thought everyone was gone. And so my uh, brother and I, right there, um, did a little hot rodding, and somebody just so happened to be on the course, and we got uh, abruptly escorted out of the uh, out of the premises. Um, and the second one, I was actually a uh, kayaking instructor um, when I lived in um, San Diego. It was kind of a part-time weekend and um, job, and um, the lady there um, was great, but also, you know, uh, had a bit of a problem with. A, my general snarky uh, personality, and uh, one day uh, whipped, <laughs> like got just, I said the wrong thing, and just completely she lost, she blew it, and started whipping VHS cassettes at me. Oh. <laughs> oh my gosh, all right. That's when you know you're fired, <laughs> clearly. All right, you guys, um, so we're gonna take uh, like three or four questions from the audience before we get you, get you out of these seats, so. Uh, let's go ahead, and I'm gonna just walk this mic around. Don't expect me to get back in that chair, though. All right, so Matt. Hello, uh, Matt Sherman from Fusion Apps. So five years ago, there wasn't a startup grind, there wasn't ES Paychecks, and there wasn't a startup week here. Where do you see the Phoenix tech startup scene in five years? Um, you know, I, I think the stuff that's happening right now, like we don't even realize the effect that it's having on us. Um, and, you know, we're absolutely going through a renaissance. I mean, Phoenix is, is, is going through those cycles of evolution that, you know, all the other startup cities have gotten to do um, that we kind of missed out on. But the, the beauty that we have is um, because we're a little bit far behind, now we can actually go through those growth cycles with a little bit of um, kind of best practices from some of these other cities. And so um, I see a, um, you know, even more vibrant startup scene. And I think that, you know, the, the cool thing that's what, what's happening here is that you have alignment across, you know, the universities, across political leadership, across the entrepreneurs, across the capital system, across the real estate guys are like, oh yeah, why are we all about, you know, tea times and rooftops? You know, of course we should have a vibrant tech economy. Like everybody gets it now. And so the fact that we're all getting it and the fact that we're all coming together and like the, the little stuff that we're doing right now is, is you know, in the next five and 10 years is gonna, is, is, is really gonna make us like, is just as legitimate as, as, you know, any other city in the top five. Hi, I'm uh, Robert and just wanted to ask you, when you f guys first started out, how did you get the initial funding to uh, fund your business ideas? And how did you deal with uh, maybe uh, negative people that would say, nah, that's not gonna work? And then my last question is, how would you describe your uh, corporate culture? 
Um, you know, Heidi and I, and this is one of the things that, you know, we were really lucky, um, is that she had the subject matter expertise. She knew the physical therapy. I mean, she's top of her field. And um, the way that I had come up through technology is, you know, it was, it was mostly, you know, sysadmin, but I learned enough of a bunch of different stuff um, to where we didn't really need any, any other help. Um, you know, Heidi was making a nice paycheck running the clinics. Um, I had a string of e-commerce stores that I had sold. Um, for a couple hundred thousand dollars that, you know, provided me enough money to live on for the first two and a half, three years. And we ate peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, and we didn't go out to dinner, and um, we just grinded it out. Yeah, we literally, in the every sense of the word, bootstrap. So I continued to work full-time through, actually, until our daughter was born in 2011. So through that sort of growth, early growth stage of, we, we just wore multiple hats, right? I worked half days on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And so I would work my regular job and then come into the, to the wet PT office in the back of the coffee shop. I would put on my HR hat, I'd put on my support hat, I'd put on whatever was needed for the organization at that point in time. Um, Brad and I had developed a system where um, we really learned how to communicate with each other very well in terms of trying to translate a physical therapist's brain and, and what we needed to do every day into a UI and you know technology. Um, and so we had developed this thing where we would develop spreadsheets and I would, I would walk through and kind of create what all the tests were that would need to be built. He would take that the next day, build through that, then I would come in and do QA every night. Right, so you get into this rather rhythm of development, QA, production, um, until we had something that was actually usable. Um, and literally, it was you know peanut butter jelly sandwiches. We didn't go out to eat much. I still drive my 2002 Highlander. <laughs> um, and Lots we, of bean burritos too. <laughs> yeah, thanks. That was enjoyable. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was really up until we. I mean, we were run rated a million dollars before we actually took that first round of funding in. So what do we do with all those naysayers? To be honest with you, we really didn't have that many. Um, what I will say that we had to deflect was people that wanted to increase our market size. So they were telling us that the PT market was too small and you're never gonna make you know, you're never going to be quote unquote successful because the market size is too small. No one's ever going to want to invest in you because the market size is too small. And what's transitioned over the years has been exactly what we did and, and stayed laser focused on was niche, a niche play, right? And we did get funding and we did, you know, contradict all those naysayers at the time. Um, but we stuck to our guns and what we believed in and what we had passion for and, and truly what was our expertise and didn't go outside of bounds. And that to me is really part of why we've been so successful in really staying in that niche market that is actually, I mean, yes, it's not a consumer play, but it's a $6 billion market. I mean, how greedy do you need to be? Hi, my name is Victor, and uh, I, want, it's, I don't have a question, but I have a big thank you for you guys, because I started up a, the uh, Arizona Agile Association a couple months ago, put out the word that I needed a location uh, to house the, uh, and uh, um, have the meeting, and uh, your number four employee, Jeremy, stepped up immediately and said, hey, I'll talk to the uh, uh, powers that be, and you're going to sponsor us uh, for our first meeting on Tuesday. So I really want to thank you, and we have a huge turnout. So thank you very much. Awesome. You're, you're very welcome. And I will say that we've talked a lot about employee number one. We still have employee number one as well, as well as employee number three. I think number two was a temporary kind of employee anyway, if we kept count truly. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, I think we have seven of our, of our first 10 employees that are still with our organization. Jeremy being one of them. Hi, um, my question is, um, you were talking about, you know, not taking in outside of funding to begin with. When you finally did take outside of funding, did you have a figure in your mind or a percentage that you didn't want to give away before? Or what was your criteria when you were looking for outside funding? Thank you. Um, I don't know that we had necessarily a number. You know, I think that, um, you know, it was, it was, 
I, I think we, we raised a million dollars because that's, you know, kind of what seemed right at the time for what we wanted to accomplish. Um, it turns out, you know, just, you know, normal SaaS, you know, you calculate market size, you calculate, um, you know, uh, you know, what your ARPU is. And I mean, you can kind of figure out what that, you know, company is going to be worth based on a couple different metrics. And, um, you know, we were lucky and enough to be able to get to, you know, a sizable amount of revenue before we were able to raise that money. So that million bucks was, you know, 17% of the company or something like that. So, um, you know, we went into our series B, you know, with, uh, you know, the majority well, well, very well in the majority and, you know, still to this day are, um, the second largest shareholders in the company, um, you know, behind battery. So, um, you know, I think our, our timing was good in a sense and that, um, you know, we grew enough to be able to attract money. We took in, you know, kind of less than we probably could have used and, and, and kept our heads down and stayed scrappy. And, you know, one of our core values as a company is Moss with Manos. You know, it's a, you know, everybody gets a $200 Ikea desk and, you know, it's not air on chairs and, you know, lattes and all that kind of stuff. It's, you know, we're a scrappy company. That's, that's what you do to, to, to be successful. So, um, you know, and then continue to do that, you know, through the Series B and, and kind of went there. So, I don't know. I, maybe not really answering your question, but um, I, I don't know that there is. And I think that, it, you know, the right amount is what's right for that market timing and the opportunity and the entrepreneur and, you know, market size. And it's, it's different for everyone, I think. What we did know going into it, being educated on what are the, um, the what do you call it? times, like four times your revenue? Multiple. Multiples, yeah, sorry, I couldn't think of the word. What your multiples should be for our type of business. So we went in there educated to understand, like we didn't want to get duped, right? Um, and the other thing is what we went in there thinking or, or wanting is to give up the least amount of equity, right? So we didn't necessarily have a number. We just knew at that point that we didn't want to give up. Definitely, def definitely didn't want to give up ownership of the organization and we didn't even come close when we knew, you know, going into it, if you're looking at a 4X multiple, which is, is what we got, is, is really something that you, you kind of have to stick to your guns with, right? Especially with the growth and the opportunity that we were able to present at that point and our run rate to where it was and the hockey stick that was already starting to form. Um, that's when you know you've got leverage. When you don't have any of those metrics to show, then you're kind of like, you're, it's a guessing game, right? You're kind of like a, sw a swag as to what you're actually able to garner as a valuation. You know, the other important thing too, I think, um, in that whole process is just having, um, you know, a, a good deal of revenue. And um, we were never in a position where we needed to raise money to pay the bills. You know, I mean, we, we bootstrapped, we grew organically, we didn't spend more than we were making. Um, you know, we ate the, the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and, and because we did that in our series A, we could have said, no, we're not going to take your million dollars. We don't need it to keep the lights on. And so we're able to get, you know, be in a, in a better negotiating position. And then we're able to still continue to carry that, you know, of the, you know, round that battery did, you know, I don't know what the number is, 6% of it went into the company. The rest of it was liquidity, right? And we didn't need that money. The company didn't need that money to continue to grow. The money was so that Battery could experience the, you know, growth, um, you know, kind of at a secondary stage um, to what we've already accomplished. So um, being in that position, is, you know, was huge, right? It's, it's, you know, you're the prettiest girl at the dance. Yeah, that's absolutely key is, is not having to, to, to need that money because then you lose all your leverage at that point. So thank you guys for the evening tonight. Um, my question is about your vision. So you guys have been, I mean, you said you started in 2006, so it's been 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. um, are you guys still executing on your original vision or how did that sort of you know, change as, as you learned more about business and uh, and your customers and, and the needs of the market? You know, what's really awesome is the answer, I can absolutely say the answer is yes. We still have the back of the envelope, that, that trip back from Prescott, that we started writing down what the vision of what PT could be. Um, and we still haven't executed on all the things that we've written down on the back of that envelope, but we've executed, we've definitely checked off the majority of them and, and more, obviously, in response to the market. 
Um, but we still have, and we've actually even created our BHAG, or our Big Hairy Audacious Goal for the organization, to actually meet all of the goals that we had originally set out in that original vision. That was, is, inc is incredible as in if I say it out loud right now, but also to the fact that we've been able to um, have as many people in our organization and also the likes of Canal Partners and, and Battery Ventures believe in that vision. Right, and they are all behind us to try to execute and make that vision come to reality. It is, it is incredible, as I say it out loud. It really is. All right, you guys, let's give them a hand. Thank you, Brad and Heidi.